Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Wawa Hagen Fest, for uh, letting me speak, and thanks for your time this afternoon. Uh, excited to be here. Excited to be back uh, in Deadwood. Uh, the first time I was here was in 2019, so uh, it's, it's just really exciting to be back. And so uh, looking forward to spending some time today talking about a case for threat informed pen testing. Um, he gave my bio, but uh, I just want to kind of always say that I'm really passionate about like workflow and process and like getting things done. Um, and I'm so passionate about it. That was why I started PlexTrack. I hated writing pen test reports. I hated the lack of collaboration during the engagement life cycle. And so that was the impetus for PlexTrack. And so um, that's kind of just about who I am and, and the things that I get excited about talking about uh, and uh, excited to share a little bit about what, what I've been working on uh, as a uh, founder and CEO in our company as well. So um, the goals that, that I have for today for the, for the talk that I hope that you can uh, take away from are, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the traditional approaches with pen testing, uh, threat intelligence, how those kind of merge together, uh, and, and what does a threat informed pen testing program look like? Right, uh, and so that's that's really the the only two things I really want to cover today, and so I hope hope uh, you enjoy it. Um, but if not, there is one other thing that I'm trying for the first time ever. This slide deck is actually a CTF. There is a puzzle in, in, encompassed in this slide deck. So if you don't care about what I have to say, at least you can pay attention to the slides and uh, try to figure out the the uh, the uh, answer at the end, and then. I do have a giveaway, um, but because why not? So pay attention. Uh, if, it, if anything, pay attention to the slides, right? So first things first, uh, when we always kind of come into a, to an operation, we always want to ask, what are the problems that we're trying to solve, right? I think it's easy to start solutioning a lot of things when we get introduced to problems, um, but to take a step back and actually say, hey, what is the overall goal that we're trying to, to do here? And so when I'm talking about merging some of these ideas around threat intelligence and penetration testing, the goal is actually to say that, hey, none of those things that they're doing in and of themselves are bad. The traditional approaches to how uh, teams operate in their organizations and as consulting firms, not bad at all, but it's like, are there opportunities for improvement, right? So the goal is, is to, is to kind of come together and understand what that means from a threat and tell, uh, threat informed pen testing program when we always start off like, what problem are we trying to solve? Ultimately, we're all on the same team, right? We're all on the same mission of making the world a safer place, trying to identify where are our gaps from a security posture perspective and are we getting better? And so I always like, I just throw up some random graphs just to kind of highlight like the, the end, at the end of the day, the goal is to actually be able to see a trend towards improvement and, and better defense, right? And so whether you're a pen testing team, whether you're a threat intelligence team, whether you're a security engineering team or a SOC team, there's all kinds of different disciplines. Maybe you're not even a security person proper, but at the end of the day, we all have a security role in our companies and for who, who we do business with. And so the problem that we're trying to solve is that we're trying to make our organizations and ultimately the world a safer place and to ward off the attacks and be able to identify those as quickly as possible when they happen. And this is kind of the, the lead into the proactive approach, utilizing threat intelligence as part of your pen testing service or program. To kind of highlight you know, the traditional approach to pen testing, which how many pen testers do we have in the room? I would presume a lot of, a lot of folks in this audience are pen testers, so you don't have to raise your hand, but versus you know, security engineers or threat, intel and threat intelligence analysts and those kinds of things. But uh, the traditional pen testing approach tends to be broadly scoped because due to its periodicity, right? So a lot of times a, a larger scope pen test is, is the annual thing. Uh, it happens you know, fairly infrequent uh, and can be, can be large in scope, right? Uh, pen testing firms or red teams may come in with a, a baseline methodology that they apply to pretty much every engagement. This could be both from a you know, consulting perspective. This is what I did as a consultant. And then I was also on an internal team. And so you always kind of come at it with an approach of like, hey, we want to always make sure we're covering these basic things, right? So that might be utilizing the PTES, pen test execution standard, uh, the OWASP top 10 if you're in the AppSec space. Um, or you might have your own custom methodology, which is very, very common. Like, hey, these are the things that we always want to make sure we cover in any kind of engagement, regardless of when we do it 
uh, and what, what is the scope. Uh, these, this approach can generate a lot of smoke uh, in, in the environment, right? And it can generate a lot of smoke for uh, the blue team or the defensive team to start to go uh, track down, right? And maybe some alerts or, or just in general, once they receive the report, uh, actually, I have a, a next slide about that, it, the, the report can often feel overwhelming, right? There can be lots of findings, uh, sometimes multiple attack paths, right? And this feeling of like, okay, where do I start, right? So let's take a knee as a blue team, let's take a water break, let's go get some water uh, and regroup. Let's prioritize what, what did we just learn from this engagement that may have taken uh, two weeks to a month, uh, regardless of whether it's a, a web application test or like a normal pen test. Uh, but like, how do we prioritize what are the critical findings, right? And this is kind of a general traditional approach and, approach, and there's limited collaboration with the blue team and the red team, right? Uh, and whether it's a consulting uh, provider, they're going to provide their, the results and, and then move on to their next engagement. Internal teams are also very uh, overtaxed at times and, and working on new engagements all the time. So once the, once the results are delivered, uh, they start to start to get a little bit uh, fuzzy, right, as to how to approach them. Right. Additionally, when we're talking about you know, adversary emulation with respect to penetration testing, it's not always a threat-based threat approach, right? We may use TTPs out of MITRE ATT&CK or uh, identify some new cool things from a talk at, at, you know, at, at Wild West Hack and Fest that I want to take back and utilize in my, in my engagement uh, the next time I go, but it's, it's broadly scoped, right? Um, you're typically at the whim of whatever specific tester is, you, is, is doing the engagement, whether that's uh, you know, a, a web app test or not. Like you're kind of, kind of similar to an audit in a financial audit, right? Where you're kind of at the whim of the, the depth of the financial auditor, right? Uh, so if you're not scoped ahead of time, uh, that, that test could actually reflect multiple threat actors, right? And, that's, and again, I'm not saying that's bad, but that's, that's typically... The, the red teamer or the pen testing team, they're gonna have kind of free reign on the environment, right? And uh, unless it's really you know, narrowly scoped at the beginning. Uh, so this is kind of, it can be kind of threat specific, but not always, that's not always the case and not always guaranteed, right? So if we talk about, so that's kind of like this kind of intro, may not be news to everybody. I just wanna kind of set the groundwork. Like that's kind of what I mean when I talk about like traditional pen testing, right? When we talk about traditional threat intelligence, now full caveat, I've never served as a threat intel analyst. I've never been in threat intelligence as a, as a job. I've only been a consumer of threat intelligence and uh, only you tried to utilize it the way that I think that I should when I've been the recipient of threat intelligence um, at different organizations. Uh, but I have observed, I have observed, so these are my observations. So if you are a threat intel analyst and you're like, man, it's full of smoke, talk to me later, I'm happy to take that feedback. Uh, but you know, from, from my perspective and what I've seen in organizations with a lot, there can be one to multiple feeds of threat intelligence. Uh, you maybe get lots of different detailed reporting through, uh, through these feeds with specific indicators of compromise IOCs. And this is supposed to inform the defensive team of work. What do they do with these IOCs? And they put, typically they get put into signatures for alerts of basically within your SIM, within your firewalls and all these things. So it's a very, it's, it continues to be a responsive and reactive approach saying, have we been compromised with this specific threat uh, in, in the environment today or in the world today? So it continues to stay focused on reactive, a reactive approach to identifying the threat in our environment. This can lead to big fire drills, right? So uh, take Log4J, for example, stakeholders are gonna say like, hey, this is happening in the world. You know, I'm sure everybody felt some of the pain in some fashion around Log4J. Uh, so it's a big fire drill, right? And ransomware outbreaks in the world can, can lead to questions where it, it, you spend your weekends trying to identify, like, are we vulnerable or susceptible to these types of threats? Um, the Uber, you know, the recent Uber breach with MFA fatigue, right? These are all things that just tend to pop up that as an organization, we want to be able to say like, hey, are we, you know, how, how quickly can we respond and, and, and identify if we have these gaps in our environment or not, right? So this is kind of the, the traditional threat intelligence report. So we talked about, you know, traditional uh, pen testing approach, traditional threat intelligence approach. Um, that leads to kind of the traditional security team, security program response where 
you have this, hey, the sky is falling all the time type of a feeling, right? And uh, the majority, if not all of your time is spent responding or reacting. And based on the capabilities that you have as a team, it can start to feel overwhelming and you start to get fatigued through alerts. Uh, there's still continued limited collaboration with your red teams and your pen test teams or potentially even your threat intelligence teams. And like, hey, I appreciate all this information. What am I supposed to do with it? Uh, and then you you tend to receive those dreaded questions from stakeholders like your executive staff or your board members like, hey, how secure are we? Or, hey, you know, how how is Log4j coming, right? Those kinds of things. And you want to be able to provide, you know, a decent answer, but it definitely it definitely puts you on edge, right? So that's just, that's just like the approach for how uh, these, I've, I've typically seen these things play out. So can we be doing better, right? Again, those are not, those are not necessarily bad, right? It's just as, as we continue to grow as an industry, where can we optimize? Where can we, where can we find opportunities for improvement? Here's, here's the case, right? The case for making this, making this flow better and actually having a better approach to your pen testing program. Uh, it, it involves iterative, test, iterative testing. So whether you're a consulting firm or whether you're an internal team, Take it from the mindset of, I'm, I'm going to do constant iterative testing on an on, ongoing basis. I'm going to move out of the reactive uh, space into the proactive space. Uh, and it builds stronger collaboration this way. I want to be able to say, as a blue teamer to my red teamer, hey, I want to make sure we're covering some of these gaps that I feel we might have an uh, exposure to. And then the red team can also say, here's what's happening in the world because we've just collaborated with our threat intel team and we want to apply the context to our environment and then actually execute a test to see if we can detect this. So you have a much stronger collaboration. And we'll talk about this a little bit, a little bit more. But uh, there's also, from a program perspective, you do have to have agreed and defined metrics, right? So anytime I refer to a program, that means that you have to measure what you're doing. And otherwise, you're just doing a lot of activity that's still good, but you're not able to show much uh, progress. You're not actually to show, able to show the trends that you're making and whether, whether the things that you're testing today are continue to be tested tomorrow. Uh, so the whole goal is to actually become a, a, a more well-oiled machine. Uh, threat intelligence can actually drive the scope of our pen testing engagements, right? We can actually identify here are the threats that I actually think are applicable that are happening in the world today or have happened in the last six months that we want to start applying to our testing program and be able to measure our progress against those. So it actually refines the approach for the pen testing team as well as uh, helps helps guide the conversation on the blue team side as to what their focus actually is. This also helps drive conversations at the higher levels. Uh, so now you can actually speak intelligently to your executives and your board around, yes, this is the way that we approach these types of threats as they come into the world. We don't know what the next log4j is going to be, but here's how we've approached this in the past. And so when those things happen, here's what we're going to do to, to alleviate the concerns or identify where we, where we have gaps. So let's, let's continue to talk about enhancing both, right? So this is where, uh, this is where I tend to kind of get on my soapbox and we talk a lot because I, I think if you've, if you've seen me speak before, I talk a lot about the power of purple teaming. So let's head in the purple direction, right? Everybody is a red or a blue teamer. And when we bring them together, we have much deeper uh, progress, much better collaboration. So let's adapt our intelligence towards testing and validation. Uh, threat intelligence is, is still perfectly great for use in our defensive capabilities and how we might inform our defensive uh, posture, but it should also help us define what should we be testing. Right? What should we be identifying as potential gaps in our environment? So let's, let's take the threat intelligence, apply it to our test plans as a pen testing program, and then we can actually identify, here's the progress that we're making against these specific threats, in addition to the other scoped testing uh, aspects of our, of our program. So the most important aspect of the threat intelligence piece is actually to apply the context that it applies to in your environment. Right? So, um, so we'll mention context, 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 right? So if I'm looking at threat intelligence from 1972, which may, not, may or may not exist, 
it's maybe not as relevant, but we, we may still like to identify like, hey, is there something out of some of this feed from, or this detail from that long ago that might apply to our environment today? But if I hadn't documented that up to this point, I'm not really going to be able to show like, what were we doing then versus what are we doing now? So the key questions that you would say when, with respect to context is, how would this threat actually participate in our environment or execute in our environment? If we have this threat actor or this type of ransomware, how would this actually execute and succeed in our environment? Uh, you know, similar to the conversation that we have a lot around vulnerability management, right? Where you do a vulnerability scan and you get all of these findings that are related to uh, assets in your environment, and they're they're rated as different different severities: critical, high, medium, low. But but that doesn't always necessarily provide the whole context of what you were scanning, what type of environment it is in in within your systems, and whether or not it has other compensating controls around it. So that's the most important piece of taking the threat intelligence and actually applying the context to your environment. Uh, so, how, you know, how would this actually execute and, and work together? So the threat intelligence team can say, like, here, here's what here's what we're seeing in the world. The pen testing team can say, work with the blue team and say, like, okay, if if we were to if we were to experience this in our environment, what what would be the key factors of for success? Because it may not be exactly the same TTPs that the threat itself would execute, but if I have similar items, I can still track to that, right? So then it, it begs the question, what do I need to adapt with respect to my test plans? Do I need to change any any other TTPs or add or remove some so that we know we're getting coverage, right? And at the end of the day, that's the most important part. And can I emulate this same threat in different ways, right? So uh, it comes back to that whole emulation versus simulation discussion of Emulating is, hey, these are the general techniques that these threat actors are going to take. And by the way, most threat actors are not going to do the exact same thing in every environment, right? They are going to live off the land. They are going to identify the gaps that would exist for that specific environment. But there are general themes, right? So what are the specific TTPs that I would need, that I, that I believe as a defender and as an offense offender to be able to say, like, this is what would actually succeed in this environment? Um, again, kind of like, Coming back to the MFA fatigue example, it's not it's not per se to say that like hey if you have the Oct if you if you're using Okta versus a different uh, SSO provider, it's it's the notion of are we fatiguing our our users are we ex are we exposed to fatiguing our users with MFA right and being able to get in that way or so something like that right so that's kind of just a basic example. What does that mean then from a program perspective? Right? How do we shift left from our pen testing uh, approach? And again, this is this is pen test themed again, right? Because this is threat informed pen penetration testing. But let's continue to focus on a continuous approach. And I've been a part of an organization that does this, and then we have a lot of customers that do this as well. So I, I've seen it be successful. We have also done some research on it. Uh, and so how we did it in our environment when I was a, a security director was we started to take, break things down into small pieces, right? And we're saying, hey, every two weeks, similar to like a software development life cycle, we're gonna take every two weeks and we're gonna focus on something, right? Maybe it's this threat actor or something else that's going on in the world, but we can always inject something if something immediate happens, like what the Mirai bar botnet or you know, something like that that's just immediately happening today. Is there a way to, to bring that into our test plan on a continuous basis? Um, it's not not an annual event. You still would have your annual penetration testing. You would still do your uh, your annual audits and and approach the the same way you do for compliance and those kinds of things. But in order to be able to demonstrably show progress, it needs to be a continuous effort. <clears throat> and this, by the way, doesn't have to mean that you have an internal security team, right? A, a testing team. You can utilize your third party service provider to do this for you as well, and you can collaborate with them. Uh, I, we see lots of, of consulting firms and security providers going into a continuous approach or a model where they are servicing their customers on a continuous basis, right? Similar to a managed SOC, right? So uh, again, it's and, and this is not just a response exercise when we say like, hey, uh, do we have do we have the controls in place to protect against this? You actually want to use it as a validation uh, perspective. Um, so the mantra that I had. Um, that was ingrained into me 
I was never in the military. Thank you for those that were and, and or are and have served. But but when you think about the approach to being deployed in a war, you're always training, right? So uh, it's the this continuous approach is the is the mindset of like we're going to fight while we train, while we fight while we train, right? So that is the continuous approach to penetration testing, and this is the the the, the foundational elements of a pen testing program within your environment. It's, it's, it's taking it to a next level as opposed to having the, the mentality that we're only going to do this for compliance sake, or we're going to do it for that kind of that wow factor to see just all the, the massive, like huge vulnerabilities or critical vulnerabilities that exist, but actually being able to say like, hey, we're going to bite, we're going to, we're going to take this into chunks and we're going to start doing this on a continuous basis. And we're going to move uh, a majority of our time from the reactive into the proactive. Uh, so no program is successful without measuring your progress. Uh, so succeed, and, and this comes down to, hey, we, we know what exists in the world today in terms of threats, right? There's, there, there's always going to be the unknowns. There's always going to be the new things that are coming out and the new techniques and, and the new threat actors. But there is a, there is a well-refined list of, of, of known activities that go on in the world today. So let's just make sure that we know how to how to prevent or identify those in our environment. So this is this is a taking a step back of like I don't have to know all of the new fancy techniques when it comes to pen testing or in in order to make progress uh, for the security posture of the organization, right? So be able to work collectively with your blue teams or your red and your red teams to say like these are the known knowns that exist in the world today, and we can adapt some of those techniques as well throughout. Our, throughout our continuous approach to be able to continue to say like, hey, this is what's working, right? These are the things that are working in our environment. These are the controls that we're continuing to need to work on. And, and this is where we have massive gaps, right? Where we need to invest in new technology, go hire more people, uh, those kinds of things, or even, or even fire a service provider because they're not helping you actually get better. They're just trying to you know, find the things that they like to find. And what I think is also really important is celebrate those wins together. Just because you're testing against a known known where it's like, it seems like it should be fairly obvious that you, you've detected it or haven't, you know, haven't been able to detect it before, but now you can. That's, those are big wins. And, and these are things that by doing this continuously and having a, a way to track and measure your progress actually shows that you are getting better, right? And uh, so I always, like, I always like to emphasize that let's, let's bleed purple, right? So, uh, so that's the start of a, of a program, and and really, it's 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 moving into the purple teaming mindset uh, of collaborating with not just the the red and the blue teams, but also the threat intelligence teams, and letting them inject their uh, their intelligence, in applying the context into environment. So, again, I said I love process, uh, and uh, this is not perfect, but this is this is a general process of like how do we start you know using threat intelligence into our pen testing program? Because if you think about a pen test program in general, where you maybe have uh, a continuous approach, you are going to be regularly identifying our, your test plans and what you're going to be executing, and then reporting on that. But from a from a threat intelligence perspective, let's say, hey, we've received threat intelligence. Let's all collaborate on what is the context within our environment, and I, I can't emphasize that enough. What is the context within our environment? What are the TTPs that we should actually be able to execute? So that then we can actually measure progress and be able to, with reasonable certainty, say, hey, regarding this specific type of threat, here's our progress related to how we can detect and defend against it, right? We may not be able to pr provide the exact TTPs to say like, yeah, we know exactly what they're doing and we can defend against it. But you can say in general, this is their general approach. This is their technique. This is how it applies to our organization and our industry. And here's how we're testing for it. So we, you receive the intelligence, you collaborate on the, on the context, develop the test plan, execute the test plan, validate that, that the TTPs that you were supposed to be defending against or detecting, did they, get, did they get executed? Did the tests get executed properly? Was the defense team able to identify it? Let's measure that. Then we report out to the stakeholders, here's what we've done, and then, and then report or, uh, and then repeat, right? So, so now we're going to say, hey, we've, we've done it today. Let's do it in two weeks. And, and if the results change, what happened? How do we continue to uh, evaluate what are the, what are the uh, 
what are the controls that need to continue to make uh, a difference or improve a difference in our in our posture? So, so this is a this is a fantastic approach. Uh, this is what I did when uh, yeah, when I was a security director, um, and then I do want to dive into. Oh, sorry, I got one more slide uh, on, on this before I get to a case study. But so working together, we're now bridging the gap between the reactive and the proactive approaches. And, and again, what gets measured gets done. So we can actually see coverage gaps that we have against specific TTPs. Here's an example of, of, of like a test plan that was executed for MITRE attack, right? And what were the red team outcomes versus the blue team outcomes, right? So the more data that you have at your fingertips, the better you can inform your stakeholders, the better you can inform your teams, the better morale your teams can have. Because again, we, it starts to get fatiguing when you have so many alerts and so, many, so much data and trying to do all these things, and then the, the other thing just piles in, right? So you can actually show progress, and that should actually make people feel better that they're actually making a difference. And so uh, this is what we, this is the results that we've seen also from, from uh, security teams and, and consulting firms that have adopted a, a true purple team approach to their, to their uh, program. Uh, and morale, morale does improve. That's, that is, that is a, a definitive thing. So I want to talk a little bit about a case study. I promised I would keep this anonymous. So you got to trust me that this is actually true. <laughs> um, but because uh, it is a customer of ours um, and was talking with him several weeks ago and said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this talk. I was like, you guys seem to do this really well. Are there any, any, any things, anything that you would like for me to highlight? Um, he did highlight the context issue, right? They said, if there's one thing that's, that's, uh, most important to identify is the context, right? So they they are a large organization. They get they get threat intelligence from all over, and but they have to distill that into the context of their environment. Uh, and so he said that they, they do this on a continuous basis. They have a they have a uh, every Thursday they do just iterative testing, right? And and again, it doesn't mean that you're testing everything all the time, right? This is. This is, hey, we're going we're gonna to build this into a scheduled program. As new intelligence comes in that we feel like may be urgent, we're going to test on that right away. Otherwise, we're going to build it into our, into our, let's call it a backlog, right? So they, they've been doing this for, for several years now. Every Thursday, they do these, these types of purple team exercises, uh, and they do incorporate threat intelligence feeds into that. They have a threat intelligence team. Uh, but it, again, you don't have to have those teams to be able to say like, what's going on in the world today, right? There's lots of open source uh, uh, intelligence feeds to be able to identify, here's, here's the activity that's happening. Does this apply to our environment? How would we actually test for it? As a, in addition to what is the defensive team actually doing to be able to identify this activity in our environment? So they get, the, they get the new intelligence, then they provide the context, and then that informs their test plans, right? So they build out a test plan. We're going to test these TTPs. We're going to work with the blue team to see if they identified them. Uh, and they have, you know, they have seen drastic improvements. And he said, I thought this was really interesting. He said, it's really improved their communication with their board and their stakeholders, right? So when something like, uh, he, he mentioned the Uber breach, the most recent one, uh, that when that came out, they were able to quickly develop a test plan, work with the blue team to actually execute that test plan, identify where some of those gaps were and be able to, to clean that up right away. But it also provided a better conversation to the stakeholders that like, this is how we did it. This is what we did as opposed to like, yeah, we're, we're good or we're working on it, right? So, uh, so I thought that was actually a very impactful statement is that it, it provide better, provided, excuse me, provided better visibility into their team's testing uh, program, how they're actually uh, addressing threats, because we all know that stakeholders are not going to be as, as, as focused on, you know, APT 30, I don't know all the ones, APT 29 or APT 1 or something like that. But they are going to know like, hey, you know, we just saw Uber was on the news. And how, how do we do, how do we avoid something like that? Or, you know, this, this group just got hit by ransomware. What are we doing to prevent that? And so you have a better you have a better talk track with your executives and your and your stakeholders. So, so this is just like a general case study that uh, that that we've observed them doing. And you know he provided a lot of information, but obviously wanted to remain anonymous uh, for obvious reasons. And so uh, was really uh, grateful for him to provide that context 
um, just as some validation that this is what I've observed and what I've utilized in, in other programs uh, and that it does, it does work in other organizations as well. So one quick side note to that, we did a, we did a research study about a year and a half ago, well, maybe not even that long, maybe about, about a year ago. Uh, and and we, 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 we did a lot of research around like people that are doing purple team, purple team activities and building out programs related to continuous uh, pen testing, which is where I kind of lump in uh, purple teaming as well, you know, that, that it, they do see a lot better results and have better morale and it helps inform their decision-making process. So this, this was just an interesting statistic that I just wanted to kind of throw in there as a side note that, you know, if you haven't explored developing a purple team approach to pen testing, um, I would highly recommend it. Uh, it helps you with your identification of your key uh, assets and or vulnerabilities and risks associated with the key assets, helps your management ha have a better understanding of where the true gaps are, where your, where your shortfalls are from a resource and personnel perspective. I thought that one was really interesting if you look at, um, uh, well, additional cybersecurity resources, which that, that incorporated uh, not only technology, but people. But then also supporting, you know, decision for staff increases, right? St salary increases, improving the morale and recognizing, being able to show better what kind of work they're doing and how they're making progress, right? So, so uh, with that, you know, my 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 uh, premise is that the counter threat intelligence team is is part of the purple team as well, and they can be purple. They don't have to be uh, solely identified as a as a responsive or a blue team capability. Utilize them as part of your red teaming and your pen testing program as well, um, and you, you'll continue to see better results and in, in, in more uh, informed pen testing as a service. So I realize like, like I'm going through these pretty quick, so I've definitely opened up for questions. But the kind of the key takeaways for that I hope that you got from this talk is that we are by applying a, a programmatic approach to pen testing, you're going to improve a lot more iteratively and a lot quicker from a uh, uh, security perspective, by applying threat intelligence to your pen testing, context has to be the focus, but then keep those test plans short and iterative, right? That's how we start to get into a programmatic approach. And then you, you still can have your quarterly or your, your annual pen tests that, that provide the broader scoped uh, or the, the, the multiple attack path approach to it. Um, and measure outcomes together. Collaboration is critical. Uh, focus on on what are the key things that we're trying to apply in our environment together as a as a security team and as a purple team, and then this uh, allows you to provide better assurance to your stakeholders. With that, I know that went fast, so hopefully some people were paying. It. Oh, sorry, I did have one last slide. Um, just some other resources to keep in mind. Um, obviously, there's all kinds of threat intelligence resources, but um, you know, folks. Uh, groups doing awesome things, Red Canary has their threat detection report and their atomic red team that helps helps on the purple teaming and kind of setting up test plans for TTPs. MITRE has their emulation plans and obviously MITRE attack is a great resource. Scythe has their purple team exercise framework if you haven't checked that out. And then I did mention our research pro project that we did and you can get that there. Um, I think we'll have the slides available to, to, to attendees. So with that, if you didn't pay attention at all for the last 30 minutes, can anybody name the band? And if not, I'll, I'll have some gifts for the first person that does. But I do want to, so that's, that's, the, that's the CTF part. Um, I'll, I definitely would like to open it up for any questions or any, any comments. Okay, Dan, thanks. Uh, unmute, please. All right, Dan. I don't know if I have a mic here. There we go. Okay, any questions for Dan uh, and his threat-informed pen testing talk? If you have a question, It'd be great if you come up front or if you have a really loud voice, yell it out because otherwise we won't hear you. But if, if you don't have a loud voice, you can talk into the microphone and ask Dan a question. We have plenty of time, so don't be shy. All right, here comes one. Question coming, Dan. Are you ready? Yes. It's either naming the band or a true question. <laughs> uh, no band. Sorry, sir. Uh, given your model, is there ever a time where threat emulation would make sense. Like you're actually gonna to pretend to be APT29. So g given, given what? Uh, given the model you just described, oh, yes, is there yes. ever a time it would make sense to pretend to be APT29? I, I mean, 
I, th I think that's that's kind of the application of the context, right? So it's like, I mean, for sure. But I mean, the people that have been hit with AP two twenty nine probably, you know, like we got those TTPs from from real engagement or I mean, your real attacks, right? So, so I think that's where it's like, okay, well, what is of of the victims, you know, that we know of of those of those attackers and those threats? What what would we need to actually apply so that we should be able to know, you know, is this relevant to us. So I would say like, yes, caveat with the fact, like, does it make sense for our context and our business environment? Right. So I think, yeah, it makes sense. All right. Sense. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Anybody else? Questions? Come on. Dan would love to answer. There you go, sir. Over there. Yell loud. Not Van Halen. No. Not Van Halen. Sorry, sir. Try again. Right. And nope. Nope. Pink Floyd. Nope. Nope. All right. We've I will, I'll, I'll give a hint. Floyd. What's that? Nope. Nope. I will give a hint. I mean, it's definitely related to the talk. <laughs> it's related to the talk. Yes. Sir, question up there. Prince? No, no. Prince? No, it's not Prince. Yes. Deep <laughs> Purple. Oh, we have a winner. What is the win? Oh, yeah. Oh, come up, gather your prize. Fantastic flex track purple Yeti that uh, has a really cool lid that also is a double double thing. Good That's job, Deep job. Purple. I mean, it was right Just there in front of guesses. us. Thank you. Well done, sir. Well done. Any other questions for Dan? All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Appreciate the time. And, you know, I'll be around. You you know how to get in touch with me, too. I'm on, on social and all that. But I uh, really appreciate everybody and, and have a good rest of the, uh, the day.